Hello, Dave Hurwitz at ClassicsToday.com, here with the most horrible collection of romantic music ever made. It's Roger Norrington. Oh my God, he plays the romantics, or so they say. Well, now, I, you may wonder why I'm wearing this thing. It's because I think that whenever you listen to Norrington, it's best to use protection. But, you know, I, I have to be able to talk, so I'm going to take this off. For now, temporarily, since we're done listening, and actually much more important than the mask is the earplugs, which you really will need before listening to this junk. All right. Remember now, Roger Norrington is sitting here with the Radio Symphony Orchestra of Stuttgart of the SWR, which is Sudwestfunk, you know, the Southwest radio circumstance in Germany. This is a publicly funded organization. How did Norrington have a career? Why did he have a career? It could only have happened in Germany. You know, Germany is the home of Regia Theater, you know, that director's theater, the idea that you should take normal pieces of music like, you know, Carmen that, you know, takes place, you know, in, in a bullring in Mexico, I mean Mexico and Spain, and move it someplace slightly more interesting. You know, say, for example, to an insane asylum in Guadalajara, assuming you want to keep the Spanish locale at all. Or maybe, you know, Aida. Aida has, like, you know, Ethiopians. Well, there's no reason they have to be Ethiopians, and the Egyptians have to be Egyptians. That doesn't make any sense at all. Wouldn't it be so much more interesting if the whole opera were turned into a parable about East-West relations during the Cold War? And so you could have, for example, you know, the Russians versus the Americans in Aida. I mean, you know what I mean. It's these crazy, demented... Well, Roger Norrington is the musical equivalent of that. And Germans put up with it because Germans want anything that has an ideology behind it. They're obsessed with ideology. When I was a grad student, when I was a grad student at Stanford, we had, I had a professor. He was a very, very well-known professor. His name was Hans Ulrich Wehler, and he wrote a book called Bismarck und Imperialismus. It was 600 pages in German, and you know, heavy-duty German with the, the verbs all at the end of the sentences. It took forever to read, and he spent the first 300 pages defining imperialism before he even got to Bismarck. That's what happens with these folks. It's sort of unfortunate. And we had a course, and we were not getting along terribly well, and he said to me one day, he said, the problem with you American students is that you have no ideology. And I just looked at him and said, oh yes, and German history is such a wonderful example of where ideology gets you. Well, that was the end of that conversation. Anyway, the point is that Norrington had a concept. What was his concept? The concept was romantic music should be played without vibrato. That was his concept. The rest of it was, you know, play the music in as clipped and curt and and anemic and unstylish a way as you possibly can. But the important thing was to suck all of the tone out of the string section because that meant that everybody else could be heard more clearly, not necessarily actually, as it turned out, but that that would be somehow authentic. And that's what they really did. Now we know, we know, 100% know that he was wrong. He was completely, totally, utterly wrong. But nobody really cared because he created the Stuttgart sound. It was like Stuttgart motors. It was like something for Stuttgart. It was this sound that no other orchestra had. And you can hear that sound in this absolutely grotesque box full of romantic music. So let us see what we get in this box full of allegedly romantic music. First, Schubert's not so great Symphony Number no. Nine. Ugh, you got to hear that with no vibrato. Whoa, baby. The Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. There you go. A work utterly devoid of passion or emotion of any kind. 
And then you get Mendelssohn's Scottish and Italian symphonies with a concert introduction by Roger Norrington. Oh my goodness, what an exciting thing that is. You don't want to miss it, believe me. And then Bruckner's Romantic Symphony. By now, it should be clear that when Norrington plays romantic music, his idea of romance has got to be something sort of like spending a warm and snuggly evening with Ingrid, your inflatable sex doll. That's about as romantic as he's going to get. Then you get Brahms third and fourth. I mean, he did the Brahms third and fourth. He did. He recorded actually much of this music for EMI previously with the London classical players. Atrocious performances, long since out of print, completely. Remember, remember just how you know Gramophone Magazine and these people would just ooze and and schmooze and and die with the thrillingness of it all and the newness and how it felt. And where are they now? Is there a single Norrington recording of anything that gets recommended as a reference recording of the work in question? Does anyone care about any of his EMI recordings? Does anyone pay attention to them? Are they even still in print? No. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, 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 the history of this nonsense kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Because it's all been oh so quietly forgotten. So then we get, let's see, oh my God, yes. There's absolutely a appalling Dvorak New World Symphony. I mean, you know, obviously he would be a perfect New World Symphony for today because he would have been deported within seconds back to the old world for playing it this way. Then we have Tchaikovsky's Potatique. This is the worst Potatique in the universe. As you know, the Potatique ends with this despairing finale that symbolizes death. Well, the finale dies. I mean, the whole symphony dies before you even get to the finale. In fact, it dies during the first movement introduction. There's no point in getting to the finale. It's dead. It's dead on arrival is what it is. Just dead. And then you get the Nutcracker Suite. Oh, that's so charming. My goodness, just what you want to hear. The waltz of the flowers, as long as they're like freeze dried and pressed and like made of plastic, it's those kinds of flowers. Then you get Mahler's two and four. Now, Norrington really made his splash playing Mahler. And the reason he made a splash playing Mahler is because his Mahler sounded so horrible. I mean, there was no Mahler that was ever as bad sounding and unidiomatic as Norrington's. And so he got acclaim, naturally, simply because it sounded different. And some people only care that it should be different. I mean, he could have played it underwater and he would have gotten the same amount of acclaim because no one's done Mahler underwater. And probably there's research that proves that when Mahler was actually composing his symphonies, especially the resurrection, he did a lot of it in the bathtub. And therefore, the music should be played underwater if you want to be authentic. Anyway, finally, you get Elgar in the South, the introduction at Allegro, and of course, the Enigma variations. Nobody played Elgar like Norrington. Elgar didn't play Elgar like Norrington. There's a news flash, isn't there? So the bottom line is really very, very simple. Norrington's entire career was basically a fraud. He sold millions of people, evidently. The town of Stuttgart, the German government, gramophone, that was an easy sell. He sold them all a bill of goods. And this is the result, which you can hear for yourself and confirm it for yourself because I know that you, like me, are going to keep on listening in spite of this and even if you need to wear these while you're doing it just to preserve your sanity. Thank you all. <laughs>